I hope you guys are all having a good time here at BGC Coffee Festival. Shout out to all of our participating cafes, Single Origin, uh, one of my favorite cafes, Bose Coffee, and Because Coffee both roast their own stuff and they've been getting better and better over the years. And that's kind of um, one of our main topics here during this last panel for our BGC Coffee Festival, science and methodology. And uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the food science a bit, but also the process of what it's like to make coffee. Now, to do this, we brought in some experts in making coffee, but also in observing the scientific process. Now, there's, there's this concept that we get through, um, through going to school, that there's a right answer all the time. And science just isn't like that. It's kind of a moving target. We're going with the best we know now, and we're all trying to prove ourselves wrong. That's how, that's how good science works, right? With that said, we have a very interesting panel today, starting with, I would say, our foremost coffee scientist in the country from DLSU. You're gonna hear more from him, more about him. Uh, he's also a, um, a founding member at the Philippine Coffee Guild. Please welcome on stage, Mel Garcia, PhD. Up next, we have the current reigning Philippine Brewers Cup champion. Two years now. <laughs> also the founder and operator of Cebu City's The Good Cup. You might have heard of him, Gio Visitation. And finally, our last guest for the, uh, for well, actually our last coffee guest for the entire festival. On a personal note, this is the guy who got me into specialty coffee. I consider him a good friend personal and mentor note. over all of the, you know, over the years that we've been in this business. Uh, he is one of the co-founders of El Union Coffee, Lick El Nido, Isas Macinas, OCN, Lucky Coffee Roasters, you name it. This, this dude does it all. Please welcome two-time Philippine Barista Champion, Sylvester Dan Slicemonte. Thank you, KO. Thanks everyone for coming out today. Good to see y'all. Good to be here with you, Gio and Mel. Same, same here, Sly. Ah, uh, so, so for today we're gonna talk about science, right? We're gonna talk about methodology and brewing. And to kind of give you guys a primer, we're all working on very different things when it comes to coffee. Very popular among home brewers, we talk about like the different like cool methods, James Hoffman's method, the 4-6 Tetsukasuya method. And I always tell people, if you're brewing Tetsukasuya, you're eight years behind the curve, <laughs> right? Tetsukasuya isn't even brewing Tetsukasuya anymore, right? <laughs> that, like you see him and he's like, ah, Paul, I piled a bunch of ice on top of my... <laughs> on top of my brewer. Um, and that's what science is about, right? It's trial and error, trying to figure stuff out and find out how science can help us in making better coffee, but also in making better coffee choices as a whole. And we'll get into that. Um, but first, maybe one by one, <laughs> one by one, I'll ask you guys to introduce yourselves and how you see the science and methodology of, uh, of brewing and working with coffee interacting in your day-to-day -day lives. We'll start with Sly. Hi, so um, we were just saying scientific methodology is experiment and control. And that's really kind of the backbone of uh, a lot of coffee people's lives, whether you're a home brewer or whether you're a professional like me. Every day we take a guess. How is this water, heat, and coffee gonna come together to make something delicious? And then we taste it and we test whether or not that works. And it's the same whether we're brewing espresso or we're brewing uh, hand brew or we're roasting. Um, those are all within scientific methodology as well as um, I think a lot of our farmer partners also take risks in terms of uh, how they'll process their coffee. So for me, it's an everyday thing to, uh, to have a control and to have a test or to have a theory. Gio? Yeah, I think picking up from Sly, um, there are two things that we see that's, that has been applied in coffee. I mean, the progression from the progression for coffee's advancement in terms of science and methodology is so fast. And if you look at the five to eight year scheme, people are processing their coffee differently. 
people are brewing their coffee differently, people are roasting their coffee differently. So the unique thing is it's a move, it's a, it's a constant movement of all of these parts that are contributing to the final cup. So what we are seeing is that as a brewer, when you're brewing coffee at home, picking up from Sly is control and experiment, and then you then classify. So um, these are the variables you can control, you experiment on it, and then you classify if it's tasting good or if it's tasting bad. The thing with science is no, there, there's no gray line. It's always, if it's bad, it's bad. If it's off, it's off. If it's good, it's good. So, um, and it's been extremely, it, it has been extremely exciting how coffee has progressed so fast with how it's processed, how it's roasted, how it's brewed. But then we're still trying to apply the same techniques and theories from eight years before when in fact we should be brewing it differently because of how that particular cup of, uh, cu crop of coffee has also uh, jumped over in terms of quality. So what you're saying is that so much is happening at the farm level and at the roaster level, but at the, at the brewer level, we're still doing the same things when that's not the case because your start, your start point has moved. Therefore, your methodology from that point should also move. That's a really good point. And Mel? Uh, I think uh, what, what is important for us is to uh, look back and try to appreciate what we learned in as early as grade school or high school. That scientific method, as uh, Gio and uh, uh, Sly mentioned a while ago, very essential. Uh, nothing really special about uh, science. It's, it's basically asking yourself some questions. Why does it taste like this? Uh, followed by a hypothesis, and then you uh, lay out your experimental method, uh, identifying variables and uh, uh, constants. No, uh, that's that's basically science. Uh, uh, my exposure to these guys uh, over the last several years was basically just to find out uh, at what level of uh, scientific literacy our uh, coffee professionals are, and uh, I'm pretty much pleasantly surprised. They're geeks, no? Uh, and that's what, that's what brought them to the top. And if you guys are uh, thinking about, you know, getting into this, uh, getting into the coffee scene, or better yet, uh, uh, pushing the industry forward, then we have to just go back and rekindle our love and appreciation for what we learned in high school and elementary, scientific method. I think that's something that people generally speaking, don't really, don't really think about when they think about their food is that you're actually doing chemistry in the kitchen a lot of the times, right? Like people say, oh, I don't like that. It's chemicals. Well, everything is chemicals. Your coffee is made up of chemicals. That's everything in the natural world. So understanding, okay, this is a starch. How does it become a sugar? What is the journey that it goes on in modulation with the acids that are inside that inside that item, whether it be coffee or something else or bread, right? That's all science and we interact with it uh, on, a, on a daily basis in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, at the risk of jumping off the cliff really fast, Doc Mel, why don't you tell us a little bit about stable isotope uh, analysis and um, what you're hoping to achieve with that in your work right now? That's a very what did long, you say? That's what? a very long what is that? jump, <laughs> What did you say? I didn't understand what he just back said. It, Can you say it slower, man. please? Stable isotope analysis. All right, so there's this, this, there's this thing that we're doing with DOST uh, for the authentication of, uh, for geographic identification of coffee. As you all know, many of you now are highly interested in coffees coming from certain origins. Uh, some of you probably, the popular would be Sagada coffee. And if you've ever visited Sagada, you'll, you'll discover there's not much coffee there. I like the hazelnut. And it doesn't add up. If, you've, if you notice that there's a lot of Sagada coffee in every single cafe, and there's not much in Sagada. So there's a good chance that the Sagada coffee you're drinking isn't from Sagada. And that's, that's a... Ouch! That, that's a bummer, diba. Right? You're, you're paying so much, you're expecting. So, uh, that, that concern was brought to our attention by our friends from the coffee industry, Tere, of course. Uh, uh, so, we 
we worked our way so that we could have that research uh, funded, and it is now underway. So it's on a, we're on half, we're on our first quarter already. So uh, we're working with uh, the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute also. We're using, sorry guys, we're using isotopes. Uh, we're determining the different elements that are present in uh, the coffee just to be able to determine uh, or to ID where it is from. Because the coffee beans that you are, uh, the coffee that you're drinking is basically the result of a uh, combination of the weather, the soil chemistry, the processing methods. And when you put all of these things together, it gives a unique um, uh, ratio of these different elements, which we can eventually use as uh, ID for coffee. So expect this thing to be so it's like a finger siguro in the next few years. It's like a fingerprint system for coffee. Yes. And the reason we're doing this is so that we can kind of protect our farmers and make sure that, okay, the guys who are from this specific area in Sagada, we can prove that the coffee is actually from them and we're willing to pay the price for what they're giving us rather than it getting shipped from all other parts and being consolidated and sold as, um, uh, uh, you know, mislabeled basically. Doc Mel, how does uh, the stable isotope differ from chlorogenic acids? Are they similar? Is it the same space? All right, chlor we need a PowerPoint uh, for, for this one. <laughs> but chlorogenic acids are, are just a bunch of compounds that are uh, inherent in coffee. Stable isotope, chlorogenic acids are compounds. And of course, they are made up of elements. And the, for example, uh, one element that is present basically in almost any compound there uh, is carbon. Carbon is, uh, exists in several isotopes. Sorry, guys. Uh, hey, so don't, have, don't apologize, so guys. Have, Just have, let us be nerds. Just let us be nerds for a while. So you have carbon-12, carbon-13, <laughs> all right. So the, the, the abundances of these isotopes vary, in, uh, vary with the conditions surrounding the, the cultivation of the coffee, all right? So uh, while, while a certain coffee might have the same amount of chlorogenic acids, or it might have the same type of chlorogenic or similar, amount, uh, similar types of chlorogenic acids, but the elements in those chlorogenic acids, the ratios of the isotopes in those compounds might be different. Oh, so... Chlorogenic acids can be the same from coffee to coffee, but the isotopes in those chlorogenic acids, that's what gives us the fingerprint, right? All right. Pasado. <laughs> All right. We so, got it. So, so, so one that's... Back. One point for you. You know, a stable isotope, before I got into coffee, I was really into wine. And uh, I moved into coffee because it's like much cheaper wine. <laughs> like if you wanted like a bottle of the, of the top wine, it's gonna cost you half a million pesos. You can get a kilo of the top coffees for 10,000. Not anymore. Right? Well, maybe, yeah. But if you want a kilo of the top coffees, you can hit up the websites of these dudes. <laughs> They're buying it pretty often. That, um, that lady also. But stable isotope is something that is standard in wine, right? It's not a new science, it's just new to coffee. And I think that's really important to understand in, in bringing science into our industry and into our practice of brewing coffee is that you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You can take something from one element, right, one area, and apply that into what you want to accomplish and be willing to be wrong. That's really so important about science. Gio, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, how you prepared for the for the World Brewers' Cup and the role that study played for you? And what are the things you did different that maybe before when you were just running a coffee business, just trying to brew, it worked, but to get you know, on the world stage, what had to change? What did you do different? I, th I think when I competed for the World Championships, um, it was very weird because we had two years off, um, no competition, no interaction. And then at that time, during world competitions, what happened, world coffee competitions, it's, there's an added element now of a little subjectivity apart from the objectivity. They're looking for the new trend 
in coffee. And that's so hard to predict, right? You need to really, you, you need to really think deeper to know what's the next trend in coffee as on the brewing perspective. Um, what, what I prepared for that is that I think the most common thing is, the, the, the most important thing is you need to serve the coffee that you think is the best coffee for you that will also, um, that will also score well on the judges score sheet. So if you look at how competitions um, progress over the years, you can also see how judges score sheets progress over the years. So if you look at when Tetsu Kasuya or Chad Wang won the World Brewers Championships, the scorecards, uh, the, the score sheets indicate that they will score higher for flavors, aroma, and then, um, so those, are, those two are multipliers, meaning if you score nine, it's double. So that's why that drove, let's say, Panama 90 plus to ferment their coffee, to add up layers of aroma and flavors, because it just bumps up your score, and then they won. So it really was an indicator of that's what, that's, that's a trend that they're trying to push that here. And it's arguably a positive feedback. Yeah, it's Luke. also a positive feedback. But as the industry progress from the latest competition, um, the most important multipliers is balance, acidity. Balance and acidity and body. So meaning if you score good in body and score, so they're technically looking for a coffee that's clean and at the same time balanced. So if you've noticed um, all the rankings in the world competition in coffee, um, and people who use highly fermented stuff um, rank very low because that's how the judges calibrated for the year. And the competition also took place in Italy. So, um, but on our end, what we did to prepare was to source a coffee which we think would score very well on the judges' table. Um, and at the same time, tweak as much variables as possible. Because let's say you've already locked down everything here in the Philippines, your recipe, your grind size, your roast profile. The moment you fly to Milan or Italy or where you're competing, everything changes. So imagine I brought the distilled water to, to Italy and the moment I tasted it there, it's different because maybe it was stored differently. So these are the variables that are, that you don't, that will, that will add up to a very huge sheet. And then what does that dictate? That's the, that then you apply a scientific methodology. So what are the variables I can control? I need to lock on and then build on top of that. So it's very weird. Like when I arrive, I'm, I'm sure Sly as a water sommelier understands this, that, but when I arrive in Italy, their distilled water is different from our distilled water. So what we did is I asked my friend from Copenhagen, because he was flying to Italy, can you bring distilled water from Copenhagen? And we cupped the three uh, water. The which three is weird. distilled waters. So three distilled waters and three cupping bowls. And then after that, cupped it with coffees. And it's, it's a day and night comparison. So that's, and then after that, you lock in a certain um, variable and then you move to the next. But um, I think with, with the results of the competition, I learned a lot. So the judges also mentioned that um, if you competed two to three years ago, um, your coffee would score on the top six because that, at that time we were looking for this kind of profile. It's just not, we're not looking for this coffee this year. So it's a very good indicator that they really walk you through what they're trying to choose, what they're trying to, um, because the moment they choose a winning coffee or a winning um, performance, you're technically, you're, you're technically the face of that industry in that specific, specific category for the whole year, right? So this year, if you notice Eugenides won, because when you taste Eugenides, it's extremely sweet. It's like drinking coffee with five sachets of stevia. So when judges tasted it, they were blown away with how sweet it is. And then they added up a blend to make it more balanced. So um, these are the things that, that I'm sure Sly would, would, would explain better in terms of preparing, uh, at the same time, uh, digest, uh, absorbing results during coffee competitions. So why don't you do that, Sly? Uh, thankfully, Gio said everything already. <laughs> like, uh, he, he only missed the factor analysis. We use a regression on every factor to see which one is going to hit where the judges want uh, this year. Um, in short, 
what Gio was saying, uh, it's extremely challenging to be a high-performance uh, coffee professional and to be traveling around the world. But that's what it takes to be a world champion. You know, for, to be a national champion, we can go anywhere in the Philippines and we can put on a good show with our coffee. But to be a world champion and to be a top finals, you got to go around the world consistently and know what you have to do place to place. And that, takes, that in itself already takes a lot of effort. Um, I, I've also competed twice uh, in the worlds and I've had similar challenges to Gio. You just don't know uh, what's going to happen to you to that day and what are the variables that are against you. And you need a whole team of people watching things and trying things and helping and you're, then you're just going to hope that you talk to the right judge and you know what they want this year. So um, it's a real, uh, a lot of variables like he was saying that, that you have to put together and water uh, is one of the most challenging things because the, water, the components in your water are generally a mystery to everyone. And the problem yeah. with Philippine water is a highly unregulated industry. <laughs> I won't name names, but a lot of people will write certain things on their bottles and it's not true. They write a certain mineral content, you test it, and it's actually something different. Yeah. So um, our, our water industry is highly unregulated versus the European industry, which is super highly regulated. And the definition of terms for them will be different for mineral waters, uh, content and classification versus to what we have here in Asia. Because in Asia, generally we don't have mineral water. We have very low uh, TDS or total dissolved solids, which makes it easier for us to brew and harder for us to navigate places with higher uh, mineral content. So for example, in the Philippines, we do about 70 to 150 TDS on average uh, for most of our water. And these guys are shaking their heads. They've tested their waters. And that's good. That's easy. You go to London, for example, their water is like 800 to 1,200 TDS. And it's got a whole range of different minerals in there. And then a lot of these guys also have um, mineral packets with all sorts of different things that you can add. It can create the perception of acidity. It can create the perception of sweetness in your water itself. So in the Brewer's Cup, there's a lot to consider. For espresso, at least for us, we, we follow pretty much a standard water formula, which is repeatable. Uh, usually there's a sponsor, they distill the water using a standard reverse osmosis cartridge, and then they'll add uh, mineral back into it to create those flavors. And even then, there's something um, in magnesium if you study, magnesium for some people will come out in their taste palate as salty or bitter. Yeah. And then for some people it becomes sweet. So if you use magnesium as part of your water makeup, you're taking a 50-50 shot at uh, having a sweeter or more bitter perception to your judge. That's so true. So, I've made that mistake. Uh -huh, yes. I've definitely Let's made say that mistake. If you ask the Scandinavian roasters, they all hate aqua code. Because <laughs> for them, their perception with their palate and the way they taste like high magnesium is salty. So the, mo the moment you can, you put up an aqua code sachet, then they will say that will make your coffee salty. And that's, there that's you go. genetics almost, right? Hey, culture as well. Just okay. like, you know, the Nordic states, they love bright coffees because everything to them, the, the taste profile is very, uh, let's say low. Like they like things that are very mild tasting. So they want bright stuff because that's their hit for them. And they have like, 15 kinds of apple juice at their store, you know, and they're all maasim. They're all like pH 3.5 to 3.7. It's a contrast <laughs> with, their, uh, with their choices in furniture. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> for us, we drink mango and juice and mango juice is like super sweet, you know. Uh, all of our things are different. So their palates are calibrated in a completely different manner. So competition just like this whole different universe of, of work true. and coffee that we're not used to. Let's say you're competing and your judge is a mix of, let's say, European... American and Asian, the score sheets, even with how perfectly calibrated they are, there's still a difference. I mean, that's that. So that's also tricky, right? If you have a mix of judges, so that's why competition is it. The winners, there, the winners are always dictated with. They serve the right coffee to the right judges with the right elements calibrated at the right time. Exactly. That's right. So. so Competition is great. It, it, it drives the industry forward, it does. really. That is. That is um, right. But it's, argu it's arguable that when it becomes competition season, and I know we've competed. Um, have we ever? You're also a competitor, right, K.O.? I believe yeah, you're yeah, a Brewers yeah. Cup competitor as well. I am. So I, I do consider myself a, a professional uh, competitive barista um, in the Brewers Cup um, style of brewing. And um, 
there, there's a tendency around competition season where people tend to play it close to the chest, right? Where you feel like you figured something out that, that maybe other people haven't yet and you don't want them to know, right? Um, so, kind of to counter that, that um, culture, maybe now we can take a moment to talk about something specific, right? That we used to believe, and now through science and methodology, maybe we believe something a little bit different now, right? And um, I'll give an example, right? And you can use this one or, or go with something else, but maybe you can talk about grind particles and uh, particle distribution, right? Um, the effect on coffee, what you see now, what we used to know, and what maybe what, um, what the effect is on the cup of coffee. And maybe, Doc, you want to talk about that and like um, research that you've been involved with and the guys who you've had visit um, DLSU from abroad, the work that they'd be doing as well. Uh, my answer would be as broad as the distribution curve. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it, 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 it used, of course, everyone here knows that uh, the grind size affects the uh, extraction of, of comp compounds from coffee. But then uh, not a lot are probably aware okay, that Okay, hold the, on. <laughs> that, does, do that, you that guys might know what grind distribution means? Is everyone okay with that subject size, matter? All right, so grind distribution is if you were to shred up your coffee and slice it up, are all the particles the same size? It is impossible for all of them to be the same size. There will be a certain amount of powder generated from the grinding itself, we call those fines. And then there are some that will shatter in a different pattern because they are organic material. It's not like cutting diamonds. They will break up based on where the weak points in that thing are. So that creates some that are big, some that are middle, some that are small. And if you break, divide that by 100, then it kind of gives you a, a distribution. Yeah. So, so go ahead. Right, so, so even if you put your grinder to a certain setting, you'll still end up with coffee grounds of varying sizes. And of course, the sizes will dictate whether you'll be getting more or less. Larger particles, you'll probably get less because there's less surface area exposed to the water. Smaller particle sizes, you'll get a lot more because there's more surface area. So uh, previously, Many of our friends from the coffee industry were asking us, can we measure particle size distribution? And fortunately, we have this equipment. So uh, we generously, uh, of course, we were also so curious working with uh, coffee professionals. So we had, of course, it's a, it's a really good excuse for us to go outside the university, telling them that we're collaborating with the, with the industry. So we have a laser diffraction particle size analyzer, and it gives us basically the curve. All right, laser. <laughs> Sorry, anyway, the laser. The laser part. It's anyway. It's just an equipment that uh, helps us, uh, that allows us to measure the particle size distribution. And then, uh, once they got to know that we have that uh, piece of equipment, everyone's basically asking us already what we can do for a certain idea that they have. Uh, there's a lot of. Uh, Idea say well, one one thing that uh, one memorable uh, project was about comparing the different hand grinders. Now there's this 25 pes 25,000 peso grinder versus 3,000 peso hand grinder, and we just put them to a test by measuring the particle size distribution. After that experiment, which a group of senior high school students of mine worked on, uh, we sort of realize that we, we need to know something about another variable, and it is not just the size, but the shape of the particles. Because yeah. you might have the same distribution, but the shapes of those particles might be different. So, and how would that affect? That makes you think that you're extracting from a small particle, but it's actually relatively larger because you're not measuring the other axis. Got it. So if, if you watch Star Wars, you see them flying through an asteroid field, and some asteroids are round, and some are shaped like a letter C, right? They've shattered in different ways. 
So you see the Millennium Falcon fly through the, the C-shaped one, and while they might look like they're the same size, that C-shaped one has an extra layer of surface, which would technically make it a bigger particle. That's what you're saying. You have yeah. the, 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 the laser actually passes through the particle, and this is what it sees. But it doesn't see this. Got it. So the laser only sees one, uh, one side of the particle. So what we need is a 3D laser. Uh, well, uh, we're now, some of my students now are working on moving target kasi talaga yung science. So you think that you have an answer to a question, but I'm, I'm, I'm also used to this already. I know that after a particular thesis, we're generating more questions than we, we sought to answer. You know? So now we're doing a combination of uh, uh, particle size distribution analysis and electron microscope uh, imaging. You know? so, so you have to use two three dimensions. So, yeah, yeah. You, you need two, two different data sets yeah. to create a more three dimensional um, understanding yep. lens to see through. Yes. Yeah, so it's like having two eyes and that creates a third dimension. Okay. I think I want to chime in here just to talk about what is it exactly do we want out of particle size distribution? Yes. Did we talk about that? I think no, we go ahead. I think the holy grail for most people with particle distribution is they're all the same size and all the same shape. In reality, they will never be. But one of the things that uh, we're so used to is actually bimodal grinders versus unimodal grinders. Mm -hmm. So bimodal grinders means that it's actually made to produce two types of grind size, a very fine one and a larger one. And that's supposed to go into your espresso machine, block the holes, and make your gooey, amazing looking coffee extraction that we're all used to. And then the unimodal is where um, we use coffee grinds, which are more similar in the same size. And what it actually creates is a not so nice looking shot. There is a recent white paper about um, espresso extraction and they're saying that the uglier looking shot that flows very fast the turbo is, shot. is actually more extracted. So when I learned coffee, everything had to be that beautiful gooey looking mouse tail because we're all using these grinders that were made for uni, uh, bimodal distribution. Whereas now we, we go to all of these flat burr grinders which have a more unimodal design trying to get you in the space where they're all the same size so that it doesn't block in your portafilter and now we have these like what you said, the turbo, turbo yeah. espresso. And I think that it's actually a pretty tasty shot. It just doesn't look as good as what we expect anymore. So what Doc Mel is trying to do is understand how can we optimize uh, this unimodal for the most delicious taste versus the old traditional, I think, bimodal grind. And it's more important in um, brewing than it is in espresso. I feel like um, brewers are always trying to get this perfectly uh, low range of um, distribution. Yeah, like connecting to that, I think um, in terms of in terms of grime size and it, its effect to t the taste of the coffee, um, it's applied the most. It has the most impact in brewing rather than espresso. I mean, it will have an impact in espresso, but at the same time, in brewing is you can see a more a larger window of its impact. But um, what people miss out is that we're very we become very obsessed about getting the right consistent consistency of a certain grind size but then on top of that there's also what they call extraction efficiency or water absorption rate per particle so we think like okay there's this coffee that has very low density because let's say it was processed with a totally different processing maybe it was fermented for a month and so the moment it that it absorbs water it extracts fast then you grind that coffee very fine, so you get to have a proper extraction time. That's what, that's what you're targeting. What you're told that is, you're a, told proper is a proper extraction time. time. So, and then you then miss out on the right, on, the, on how that coffee could have performed if it was extracted differently. And at the same time, it's very weird, especially with the new innovations in fermentation, roasting even, is that and all the varieties are also making it hard for brewers to dial a certain, dial a certain grind size and it has, because it's a continuously changing element and variable. But it's, there are instances where we grind 
let's say this anaerobic coffee, um, very fine, and then it extracts so fast, and then we grind this anaerobic, this same coffee coarse, and, ext and it extracts low, slow. So those are, it, it, it extracts so there's, slower. There's okay. like a tipping point right. for extraction inside. There's also yeah. that we're trying to understand why that when you grind coarser at a certain, when you, what, what specific window from fine to coarse, when you hit coarse, it starts to slow down in terms of extraction. Yes. And that explains why there are certain uh, shapes of spe uh, sphere shapes. I mean, shapes of particle size, and maybe the extraction efficiency is different. Assuming so, that they are spheres. Yeah, but assuming as Doc that they Mel are said, spheres. Once you have more than one laser, you realize they're not spheres at all. Um, question about the shape size. My understanding is, like, for particle particle size, it's either round or long. Is that is that correct, or is it really a C? No, no, I don't. Generally, right, Doc Mel, it's a round shape uh, or an oblong shape. No, it's uh, it's assumed to be round, a spherical. Okay. Uh, spherical, sorry, yeah. spherical size shape. And Key word this, being assumed. Uh, assumed, but, but in shape. reality, they're just really ir highly irregular shapes. Highly irregular, so not long around. No, not long around. Highly irregular. So it is just like the asteroid belt. Previously, uh, my understanding was the the, the flat burrs would produce the more round shape, and then the conical burrs would produce the longer shape. Is that not true anymore from your research? Uh, I have very limited grinders that I use in the experiments, but uh, they're, uh, they're definitely not uh, regularly shaped. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, the cheaper the grinders are, the more the irregular, less regular they are. The less regular they okay. are. Okay. So, guys, that's what you pay for in your grinders, huh? When you understand um, why is a grinder so expensive? Because it makes things more even. I'm, it does I'm what you want it to do. I'm not promoting the expensive grinders, huh, guys. Yeah. Uh, it's just an observation. Um, that flies in the face of my number one piece of advice to most people, which is to spend your, spend your hard-earned money on coffee and not equipment. But uh, maybe, maybe these guys maybe are saying grinder. have a bit of a balance. Yeah, maybe okay. the grinder. Just the gr the grinder, I think, would be one of the most important things after your coffee, yeah. Because I mean, you can also go to your coffee shops, uh, and if they're a nice one, they'll usually let you grind your coffee there, yeah. one or two times, and then you have to buy something, guys. Uh, on uh, <laughs> on that note, right? On that bombshell. So you say you spend on a really good grinder. A really good grinder today, and a really good grinder in three years might be completely different things. So you say, it might be, right? Because like the things we do now and things we did five years ago are very different. Um, so if you enjoy content like this and enjoy watching us geek out, honestly, we're, we're all good friends and we could talk like this for literally hours, um, but we are running out of time. So do you guys have any questions? We, I mean, yeah, come on, because uh, it's very rare that we'd have this assortment of experts on stage. Um, so if you guys have any questions, you can come here, and we'd like to answer just a few. Okay, so a while ago you mentioned, was that uni and bi... Bimodal, bimodal yeah. Bimodal. Unimodal and bimodal grind. If we were to simplify that terms, do you mean flat versus canonical? Uh, no, it's actually in the burr design. So the way that the angles and the amount of up and down in each burr, they can create a bimodal or unimodal design where they're trying to create two or trying to create one size. So the conical can have a bimodal and a unimodal shape, and so can the flat burr. So when you look at a burr, can you tell? No. No. This is the, this is the science uh, of geometry uh, that all of the burr manufacturers hold very tightly which we're only starting to learn more about now these days, which is why you're going to see the quality of grinders uh, get better and better at the cheaper price brackets. And on that note... Thank we, you for that question. Thank great you so question. much. That is a great question. You know, um, over the years, we, it really started with Comandante, right? The Comandante came out with this crazy yeah, grinder. As we, know, as we know. As we know. And we've seen that technology kind of trickle down. And I think it's really telling. It's kind of come out in the news. I don't want to talk too much about it, but Comandante has taken some legal action against some of the smaller companies recently. And it kind of gives you an idea of how, how that technology is, is, is making it through. Because if it wasn't, then what, what's going on over there, right? Uh, any other questions? All right. So, so thank you to the one who asked, who asked the question. Um, 
For that, when you hop over to the t-shirt booth, you get a t-shirt on us. All these guys are going to get t-shirts as well. Um, Nika will help you out with that and bring you over to Wenge. Um, if you like content like this, again, we could talk for hours. This is, this is our cup of tea. Um, we do a lot of this on Daily Drink Magazine, dailydrinkmag.com, and our YouTube page, which is Honeycomb Manila. If you want to dive deep into that stuff or watch this again, we're going to try and put all of this up there so that you guys can continue to... Um, maybe if something flew over your head, you could, uh, you could take a peek at it there. Um, for all of our panelists... You guys are going to be given some nice gift packs of a t-shirt over there. Um, and to finally wrap things up, you have a question or you just want the t-shirt? <laughs> yeah, he wants both. Yeah, Come he on, wants bring, both. Bring yeah, the question. Get it, but you'll get a t-shirt. Don't worry about it. Hello. Hello. Can I ask, what's the perfect brew for uh, iced coffee? Is that espresso or is that hand brew? Or is it laser brew? Uh, <laughs> hand brew? Laser brew. Pour over? With a pour over. Do you guys have an answer to that? Um, I don't think there's a perfect recipe um, for iced coffee. Um, I, th I think that question, we can look at it in different perspectives. But if we really break that question down, it will all boil down in your preference. So if you prefer something a little more on the bolder side, a certain recipe that has lesser ratios will, will work. So I myself... If I pref if if it, it all boils down on preference, at the same time, what do you want to drink during that particular time of the day? So if I, if I woke up and I, I need something that's on the bolder side, stronger side, so I would compress the ratio a bit more. Um, but how I do iced coffees is um, I brew it separately and then I add the ice. So that's how I I, I I go about in terms of curating a recipe. But for that, um, I think a ratio, a range of ratio that I would look at is around one gram is to 10 ml. Um, and then you add 100 grams of um, ice on top of that uh, extracted coffee. Um, if you want something, if you, you have a coffee that's really nice, very floral, you want to extract more flavors out of the coffee, you can extend the ratio up until one is to one gram is to 15 ml, and then add 10, uh, 100 grams of ice. So it really depends on your preference and how you, what you want to achieve in the final cup. Sylvester, do you have an answer to that? No, I, I agree with the original part of that, is that you have to figure out what you want to taste first before you put it on ice. The more interesting question for me there is, how does the, how does the ice affect the, the amount of extraction and the flavors that are held in the brew. And that's going to be for another discussion. Do you have an answer? I have a terrible answer. You guys are going to hate my answer. Do you have one? Well, the, 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 that's also going to be a problem because the, as the ice melts, it's also going to yeah. change the... We're, we're looking at the therm thermodynamics, right? Yeah, yeah. and the, the, the temperature gradient in the, in the drink. So. so my answer... Oh, sorry. My answer to the question... Um, because I face the thermodynamics problem and like that there's a drop off, right? There's a, like of how it's changing over time. And I wanted to find a way to avoid it. So the way I do iced coffee now is that I make four liters of coffee. I take 260 grams. I grind it at espresso grind and I brew it over nine minutes, either through a machine or using several kettles in a big basket. And I put it into a vacuum container. I let it sit in the vacuum container to build up in acidity for four hours. So four, four. And then I bottle them and I put them into the fridge overnight. I do this, I do this at a one is to 18 ratio so that we get a lot of coffee and a lot of flavor out of that. So if you guys want to try it, I find that the acidity levels are really high and you get bright notes like lime. Um, which is like lemon, but with more malic acidity. Um, our current coffee, Elf Ethiopia Limu Filter, um, that's how I'm brewing it. If you want to try it, we have it for 75 pesos at the Honeco Manila booth today. Um, but that's how we're brewing our iced coffee, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. So I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you so much. Um, and talking about brewing, we are out of time here, but we do have um, something cool for you guys. Gio is going to do a demo, brewing demo for all of us right now. So Gio, why don't you come here and set up. Um, he's going to do it in the style. You can put your mic into the, into the clip. And Gio's going to do this in the style 
of, of, of a Brewers Cup. Oh, the scale. Um, Someone's got to run and get a scale. All right. So, Doc so and I are, are going to talk oh, you well, through it. The water. So, in, um, in the World Coffee events, there's a competition, and we also hold a national competition called the Philippine uh, Brewers Cup. And in this competition, you have to serve three. Three. Three coffees. Three, three coffees. Judges. Three coffees to three judges. And he's got to prepare all three coffees in seven minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Ten minutes. So the idea is that he is able to brew the same exact coffee for each judge and that what he says is what you're going to taste. And it's got to be the most delicious thing you've ever had before. That's the hardest part. Like, how do you know what these guys want? So it's a, like you said, it's a, it's a very um, tricky slope to be in. And uh, on the stage right now, what you'll see in front of him is a brewing kettle. And this is a kettle that uh, heats up the water to an exact temperature. Water. And if I'm not mistaken, it's by uh, the brand Fellow. And um, he's using a plastic Hario V60 brewer, which uh, became more popular in recent years because we found out that, wow, uh, plastic is a better thermal insulator than ceramic, which we all love. So those are some of the things that we found out along this way. And if how, how at, recent, Sly? How recent have we found that out? I think it was like four or five years ago that the world uh, found out about that. Oh, is that true? Okay. Yeah. How, what, well, what's, your, what's your take? Oh, just something, you know, I, something I said in, uh, in the Brewer's Cup when I, when I did really well in that. There you go. Uh, so all of, out of all the V6Cs, the plastic is the best. Yes. Uh, yeah. So popular knowledge isn't always right. It, it's just popular, guys. And it, <laughs> right? and it's strange because people say all sorts of stuff about glass and bronze and the different materials, right? What's that? Because of the, the aesthetics, which is also important. Like when you're in a hobby, the way things look uh, is also really important. Yeah. Yeah. So we're okay. going to get some cups and the scale. Uh, aesthetics is important when it comes to feeling proud about your business. It's also good marketing when it's business. But in terms of like getting like great extractions, the plastic one is actually really good. It's BPA free, and uh, and you're you're not going to ruin it by dropping it. Yeah, that's right. Which is major, guys. <laughs> Anyone who's been in this hobby for a while knows what it's like. You can go on some of these uh, Facebook user groups and see all of the pictures of people of sh with shattered uh, shattered range servers and V60s and origami brewers because um, ceramic and glass they all break plastic doesn't it's one of the great things about the AeroPress but for some reason people still press their AeroPresses into glass containers <laughs> so the AeroPress is not gonna break but the glass at some point it will yeah for me my, my favorite material for a certain brewer is plastic Aside from the practicality, I mean, it doesn't break. It also is a good thermal insulator. Like, it doesn't... We tried experimenting on plastic, ceramic, you know, the usual. Mm -hmm. um, and then we tried experimenting it with a different environment temperature. And you can really see that plastic, the common uh, character that is highlighted with plastic brewers is that the sweetness is just more consistent. Even if the, there's a huge change in the environment temperature. So normally Thanks. for uh, Brewers Cup competition is that um, we're asked to serve three coffees, uh, three different cups of the same coffee to three judges. And then there's one judge who just looks at you and checks if you're, what you're saying is what, being, is what is applied to how you're brewing it. And that judge is what they call the technical judge. So if you say, I'm going to brew 60 ml of water and you brewed 61, 62, they're going to slash out one, one point, point out of your scorecard. So that's, that's how uh, the competitions are designed. At the same time, um, there's also a certain volume of water that you need to brew, that you need to serve at least 180 ml. We saw this yesterday at, at AeroPress Championships, people getting disqualified because they didn't hit the 150 ml minimum. Yeah, so it's a common, um, it's a common error in the world competitions because, you know, you get nervous. Let's say you've already brewed and then you underserved. So even if the first cup, second cup is scored so high, the third cup, they'll score zero. Yeah. So that's how tricky it is. And it's hard because it, 
you're, you're, you, you need to be on a state of flow to think about all of these things. At the same time, you need to... So the judges are seated in front and they're considered as um, the true... Uh, the judges are just considered as the truth tellers and they are the ones who validate if you're saying the truth. So let's say in this coffee, um, you will experience flavors of mango, pineapple, or let's say um, orange. It needs to show up in the cup. It doesn't need it. If you're saying this particular flavor and it's not there, they will remove that and you're going to be deducted like two points for that. So it's a bit, it's a bit critical because you're trying to brew coffee to a very different set of judges that maybe their orange is that this judge his orange is very intense this judge is his orange is very faint so that's why after after the after they score you they go back to the backstage and deliberate to um, bounce back and you know see each other's score sheets if they're scoring the right flavor or they're if they're tasting the right flavors in the meantime we are going to be tasting the coffee that he brews oh, yeah. And we will be the judges in this situation and truth tellers. And uh, maybe, should we give Geo scores or should we just, uh, what do you think, Sly? Zero. <laughs> Wrong uh, cup. It's not good cup. The whole 10 minutes performance is patterned after explaining what, will, what should the judges expect and why, why is that particular sensory profile, what, what is the largest contributor of why is it tasting like that let's say if if the judges would if you if you share to the judges in this coffee you will experience mango where is that mango coming from is it coming from the fermentation is it coming from the varietal is it is it wait, contributed wait. by there's mango in my coffee <laughs> it came from somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah the yeah. usual the usual concept is if i'm planting mango here and there's coffee here, you will have flavors of mango. So apparently if, you have, if you're using cowdish as your fertilizer, coffee will also have hints of that. <laughs> what, if you drink kopi luwak, it's gonna taste like what? Uh, <laughs> luwak. Uh, okay, um, that doesn't, fall, yeah, it doesn't so come through. So two, pro two programming announcements. So we are about to start the Latte Art Throwdown. If you are registered, you must report to Espresso Stage B now, it is first come, first serve. The wait list is 28 people long. So if you do not report, you will get knocked out by someone who's already there. So you, you will get default. So please, look if you Dave. are registered, go to Espresso Stage B. Look for Dave Dorsey uh, so that you can prepare and practice because everybody only will get one practice with the oat milk. Good. And then next, stick around after this brewing portion. We got DJ Honey in the house, Woo! who's gonna be playing some nice uh, vinyl 45 for you guys all today. It's uh, it's something. And for those who don't wanna join over there, you can stick around here. We're gonna have a good time the rest of the night. After DJ Honey, we got Diego Mapa playing as well. Yes. Nice. What's that? Uh, he's asking for a shirt. Diego is your student. <laughs> is he going to get a shirt for his question? Yeah, you're going to get a shirt for your question. Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, come here, Nika. <laughs> Dude, that's a really good question. Can you please hook him up with a t-shirt? You, you ready to roll? On that okay. note, I, wanna, I want you guys to put a big hand together over here for Kiefer. That's Kief6. He designed one of the shirts over there and all of the design for BGC Coffee Festival. That's the man. If you guys have been enjoying the colors and the branding, Beautiful, uh, ask beautiful. for that guy's autograph. He's gonna be. He's gonna be someone. All right. So I think Gio is about ready to go. Yeah. And um, you call time when you're ready. Sure. Time. Yeah. So the coffee that I'm brewing today is a coffee from Colombia. Um, what What makes this coffee special uh, is that it comes from a family, and the name of the family is the Bermudas family. So the whole clan produces coffee. But uh, what makes it more special in terms of the flavors of the coffee is that um, uh, Diego Bermudez is the guy processing it and this guy has been working previously for the wine industry so that's why in this coffee you will experience very different flavors that can also be connected to like tasting white wine um, so my common recipe when I'm brewing coffee is that I want to brew 
it and at the same time I want to brew it with a recipe that I can replicate day in and day out at the same time a very easy easily replicatable recipe so today I'm brewing this coffee using 20 grams of coffee ground coffee um, pre-ground at, at around medium course hopefully to achieve around two minutes and 30 seconds brewing time at the same time I'm going to pour 300 ml and I'll, I'll be pouring it into five identical pores of 60 ml. So this part is what is commonly associated as the bloom, where we f first pour our initial water to the coffee and then let it sit for about my concept of brewing is I let it sit for about 25 to 30 seconds. Um, that range will help us um, pre-wet the whole coffee ground so that by the time we pour our next water, we can already start extracting the volatile compounds at the same time the flavors of the coffee. So um, this is a geisha variety from Colombia and it's processed through a carbonic maceration infused with yeast that's available that's uh, it, they what Diego does when he uh, processes coffees is, is that he uses specific yeast strains that he processes it together with the coffee as full cherry so um, coffee already has sugars as cherries and when I talk about fermentation they're using those sugars and breaking down those sugars to cop carbohydrates to produce to get Acids. into a malolactic or lactic fermentation at the same time it will also um, it will also develop organic acids at the same time yeast and if you over ferment the coffee it will turn into alcohol so that's why some coffees taste like a little wine. like booze or yeah, wine or whiskey but what makes this coffee different and what makes this coffee not taste like a bit alcoholic is that um, Diego stops this fermentation as full cherry um, after seven days and then depulps the cherry to get the mucilage or mucilage and the mucilage is also a source of glucose and sucrose so he stopped the fermentation and he has this parchment covered with sugars um, and use those sugars to ferment again with another different yeast strain so it's very complicated but Diego, from how Diego processes coffee, he learned this from the wine world. So he has an experience in wine and um, he's applying that in coffee. But it's very, if you see his operations, he has a beer fermentation expert. He has a microbiologist. He also has a chemist. So that's how Diego has scaled their operations. And this coffee, when we started buying coffee from Diego in 2018, he priced his coffee at $18 per kilo. Now he's pricing it at $400, up to $400 per kilo. What does that mean and why do I support this um, style of processing and how it helps to increase the value of the product is that Diego's family now and their livelihood is better because customers are paying more for the coffee because of the quality, the sensory quality of the final cup that they produce. So that's why um, I support these innovations to, but it's not for, it, I would say it is, it takes time because Diego took around three to five years to finally dial a recipe in terms of processing. Um, and then from there, he started building up his own recipes. And for this coffee, you will enjoy flavors of blueberry at the same time, it, it also has flavors of um, peach and strawberries. Um, aside from that, you will also get a long finish of caramel. Um, and what makes... For me, I enjoy this coffee during a hot morning where you just want a coffee that's very comforting and warm. And the body is, of this coffee is very creamy as well. So I can't wait to serve you these coffees, guys. Um, I would love to se serve it to... A few volunteers. Yeah. Like Kilo. guys, by the way, um, if you like this coffee, you may have a chance of ordering it from Good Cup. So check yes. out their website. That's Good Cup Coffee from Cebu. 
Uh, and Gio's got a great outfit out there. He's roasting up some of the best coffee you can get in the Philippines. So check it out. Uh, if you don't get to try it today, um, try to order some online. And I'm hoping that uh, we can do more of these barista tables and special events where we share uh, coffees from our heart and coffees that we really love um, wow. at Philippine Coffee Fiesta. So if you want to try these and sit down and chat with us, so, uh, we'll be doing some of these So things. in the aroma of the coffee, you can already smell that it has uh, an initial blueberry profile. At the same time, it also has a very oolong tea vibe. Yes. It's very rare to be able to smell and taste the coffee like this. Um, it's likened to our Sinigang, but it's from Colombia. So earlier we were talking about Sinigang flavors. Today we're enjoying the, Sinig we're, we're enjoying the Sinigang of Colombia, which is what they want to come out of it. Uh oh, oolong na oolong. So my recipe for this, uh, for my, my recipe for today is 20 grams of coffee, 300 ml, and I broke it down to five identical pours of 60 ml with 25 second intervals. Uh, my total brewing time is around 3 minutes and 15 seconds. So this is a coffee where the way it absorbs water is very slow. Um, that's why it takes time to, for it to extract. So we call this one, we call this part extraction efficiency and it has a low extraction efficiency. But yeah, let's get to taste the coffee. All right. Great. Thank you, Gio. All so right, again, so this is uh, the Luna Bermudez Gesha from Colombia, specially roasted by Good Cup for this taste profile. All right, so Sylvester, Mr. Water Sommelier, what Yo, are you tasting in this coffee? Uh, paper cup. It's tasting delicious. It's a start of paper cup and a finish of paper cup. And in the middle... Man, the oolong is just crazy. And the, the jasmine, it's like oolong and jasmine together. And those berries come in. Uh, just in the middle palate. The acidity yeah. is almost too much and then it mellows out in the sweetness and it's just got such a long, like you said, caramel. I'm not quite on to the blueberry, Me but too. I'm definitely getting that strawberry and maybe a little bit of like kiwi and guava. So, so there are many different kinds of strawberry. This is very much like a Philippine strawberry where like you bite into it and then there's, a, there's like a thin... Are you like, talking about Baguio strawberries? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. Baguio strawberries. strawberries. There's a thin white flavor and then it deepens into a sweetness. And, and berry flavor and then goes out yeah. and that's what you're kind of getting here. Very complex, very delicious. If you guys want to try this coffee, you can get it on Gio's uh, website, which is? Uh, goodcup.ph. So we ship um, all over the world. They ship internationally. Luckily, that does include BGC. Right? And Which Luzon. Is, and Luzon. Well, it's tough yeah. to know because it's Bonifacio, global don't, city. Don't be scared, guys. So what part of the globe is <laughs> it? Anyone else want to try? Over here. Just, we're just going to give it away out here in front. All right. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys for coming and attending our panel talk on coffee science brew methodology. Let's hear it for our panel. Mel, Sly, and Gio. We thank you guys so much for coming to Philippine Coffee Fiesta. We're not yet done. Most of the program is done, but we're going to relax the rest of the night. Stick around. And uh, DJ Honey is coming up. He's going to take a moment to set up. She's doing all vinyl. So it's all ages. And especially if you've never heard of vinyl, there's going to be something special for you. Once again, let's give it up for our panel. We have Doc Mel, we have Sly, Gio, and Ko, of course. I'm, I'm amazed at how many people stuck around for the coffee science side. It's like the best attended panel. Like, who would have thought? So give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you, guys. Home brewing has happened. Home brewing is here to stay. So give yourselves a big round of applause. We appreciate all of you as coffee retailers.